Uh, thank you all for uh, for being here. Uh, I'm Kai Parker, as mentioned, and uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about my proposed project here for the Fulbright, which is probabilistic tsunami hazard assessments for Chile's coastlines. And if you can't hear me in the back, just like raise your hand or something, and I will try to speak louder. Um, and of course, I want to thank the Fulbright Commission here for, for funding this project and for bringing me here to work on this. So, I wanted to start since we're on kind of a whole other side of the world to talk a little bit about where I'm from, uh, which is pretty much mostly the west coast of the United States. And I've kind of lived kind of all across there. The blue dots are places that I've been. Uh, I originally got my undergraduate degree at Cal Poly San Luis Obispo, and then I worked in San Diego down on the border of Mexico as a coastal engineer for a while. And um, most recently, I've been at Oregon State University, which is in Oregon, as you can imagine. <laughs> and uh, my PhD is in coastal engineering, and I have a minor in statistics. And coastal engineering is a very commonly under civil engineering, so technically I'm a civil engineer, despite not really knowing a lot about building buildings. <laughs> uh, so my thesis at Oregon State, which I just graduated uh, very recently, but it's this giant title, like all theses have to be, uh, Climate Change Impacts to Estrogen Hydrodynamics, uh, Tools, Methodologies, and Predictions. And pretty much all that means is I think a lot about how climate change affects the hazards we experience along the coast. How does that change flooding? How does that change uh, erosion? And for this project, how does that affect uh, tsunamis? Things like that. Oh. Uh, so I will be working with here uh, Professor Patricio Catalan, uh, who is a associate professor in civil engineering in uh, Universidad Tecnica Federico Santa Maria. And his research interests include a whole bunch of stuff that I'm interested in as well, so it's a perfect match. <laughs> and um, most importantly, he's a kind of a local expert in tsunamis. Uh, and so he's done a lot of the research here in Chile about tsunami hazards. Uh, so the idea that me and Patricio came up with is that the Chile and the US West Coast are actually very similar in terms of the coastline. Uh, we're just on other sides of the equator. Uh, and so the idea is, can we use some of the research uh, from my thesis as well as research from just US West Coast institutions and just bring that down to Chile and kind of try and come up with solutions to problems that affect Chilean communities. And you don't really need to understand this, but this is something from my thesis, uh, thinking about kind of how flooding changes across estuaries where you can have a smaller floods, uh, extreme water levels towards uh, the entrance to inlets and it gets deeper, or it gets more uh, stronger flooding towards uh, stream flow inlets. But we decided to not specifically think about that for this project. We wanted to think about a problem that's uh, very specific to Chile, which is tsunami hazards. And so this is a picture from the 2010 tsunami in Chile, which was a extremely large uh, extremely large event that caused um, devastation, as you can see from this, this picture. And uh, Chile is really subject to these because it's a very tectonically active area. And this is a map of just 6.5 and above earthquakes in the recent future. You can see the coastline is just <laughs> dotted <laughs> with earthquakes. And, um, and a variety of those are going to cause tsunamis. And I wanted to not assume that everyone kind of understands what a tsunami is and what, how it forms. And the idea is that Chile has a subduction zone. And so the ocean crust is getting pushed under the continental crust. And at times, that locks. And when it then breaks free, the Earth will essentially move upward. And with that, that pushes water upward, creates kind of a big mound of water, which then flows out in all directions. And that's a tsunami. In, uh, in deep water, these can often be very small waves, but as you get close to shore, from a process called shoaling, they get bigger and bigger. Before long, you get these, these huge waves that call kind of coastal tsunamis. Uh, so this is another picture of the 1960 tsunami in Chile, which was from actually the largest recorded earthquake on the Earth. Uh, <laughs> on, yeah, that place. Um, 
it was uh, produced waves over 25 meters tall, which, as you can imagine, for coastal communities, that's that's huge. That's going to cause a lot of damage if we were to experience something like that again. So, so it really makes a lot of sense to try and understand what is the real hazard uh, from tsunamis in our coastal communities so we can try and plan for kind of where to put critical infrastructure, where people need to, uh, to run to if there's a tsunami, things like that. Uh, unfortunately, it's a, it's a really hard problem. And the first reason is that tsunamis are really highly dependent on the earthquake that causes them, as you'd imagine. And we can't really predict exactly what the earthquake is going to look like. Um, uh, it's, as you can imagine, kind of crust going underneath each other. It gets complicated really quick. And so we can never predict where the earthquake is going to be, how it's going to break, things like that. Uh, so it really makes sense to try and think about tsunamis in a probabilistic way and say, what these are the places we think it could occur. This is the probabilities of that occurring. And then to think about the probabilistic tsunami that would occur based on that. What are the odds of that occurring is what I guess I'm trying, trying to say. And if I use words that, are, that don't make sense, also just raise your hand and I can try and not explain things. Um, so it makes sense to think about them probabilistically. Unfortunately, that's, uh, once again, really hard to do because tsunami, they're really complicated in terms of the physics behind them. And so to try and model them, it takes a really long time, even on a supercomputer, to try and process these things and simulate them. And a fully probabilistic simulation would require on the order of tens of thousands of simulations. If we want to try and think about that picture we saw of all the earthquakes, we need to consider all of those plus all of the ones that could potentially happen. You can imagine very quickly you're dealing with a a, uh, a simulation problem uh, that could take years to not, it's not really possible anymore. And this is kind of a picture of a, what tsunami simulations will look like in terms of output results and how they propagate across um, ocean basins. This is from 2015 tsunami in Chile. So it's a, it's a tough problem, like a lot of good science problems. What do we do now? We of course want answers, even though it's hard. Uh, so the first solution is we can just ignore the probabilistic nature of tsunamis, uh, which is kind of, that's the traditionally what we did. We'll just go through and kind of simulate ones that have already occurred in the past. And we'll say, we saw this huge tsunami 2010, let's redo that one, and then we'll call that the, the flood zone, the danger area. But the, the odds of that exact same tsunami happening again is it's almost zero. Uh, so it, it's not really understanding what the, the future risk is going to be. Now, option two is we can really simplify the physics of the tsunami model to make it run really fast. Um, but the, the more you simplify things, the worse answer you're going to get. That's kind of the way it works, where uh, you're making things easier to run, but your kind of the end result, you have less faith in the answer, um, as well as where simplification start to break down is in shallow water regions, which is where we care most about, right? Once it's uh, near the shoreline, you start to impact uh, infrastructure and people, and that's where we're going to get the, the worst answers. So that's that's an option, but it's uh, also not desirable. Three is kind of where we're at currently is the most common kind of state-of-the-art solution, which is a quasi-probabilistic ensemble where we'll run maybe 10 tsunamis, um, however many you can afford on a computer. But once again, you're kind of ignoring the full possibilities of what can occur. And this is uh, kind of a, an end of note at the end that uh, Patricio, the person I'll be working with, is extremely interested in. And, that, and this is pretty much ignored by everyone who does tsunami assessments, is tsunamis are, of course, going to interact with other coastal things happening. If that tsunami arrives on a high tide, that's an additional amount of water that it's riding in on. The physics, they're also coupled physically, and so it's going to produce an entirely different uh, damage zone than you would without that. And that's, that applies to all kinds of things. Stream flow, what if you arrive in a, and the river's already flooded? What if the, way, the wind is blowing water towards shore? So this is coupled and that's often ignored, and that can be a huge factor in, in what the hazard actually is. So, uh, my background, this is a really similar problem to something I explored in my thesis. 
uh, and that when you try and think about probabilistic estuary flooding, you have essentially an infinite number of possible things that can force that flooding, ranging from waves to uh, a stream flow to different types of sea level rise. We don't know exactly what that's going to be, so that also makes sense to think about it probabilistically. And uh, you don't have to fully understand this other than to know this is something I've encountered in the past. And we decided to bring kind of the solution that came from that uh, to Chile to the tsunami problem. <coughs> With the, the idea being is something called metamodeling. And I'm going to very quickly blast through this because it's uh, <coughs> mired down in details extremely rapidly, so, and I don't want to bore you to death. But the idea is we can use uh, ideas from machine learning to try and make a very fast statistical model that approximates the slow physical model. And so once we do that, we have something that's able to very rapidly produce answers uh, with hopefully very little error. And my, a large chunk of my thesis was based off proving that this works very well for coastal models. And so um, this is a great opportunity to apply it to a real world problem. And I can, and I, I, there's a whole bunch behind that, and I'd happily talk your ears off forever if you have more questions about that. <laughs> um, so, uh, so the idea is once we have this very fast model, we can then simulate a variety of different earthquakes at various locations along the Chilean fault system. We could say, what are the odds of earthquakes occurring anywhere along the Chilean coast? And simulate all of those. We can then simulate the co-occurrence with all of the various forcings that it could occur. Um, kind of like we were talking about before. And once we've done that, and we're talking tens of thousands of simulations, uh, crossing all of these different possibilities, we're able to create an end product that is going to look something like a probabilistic flood map. So this is a quick thing I pulled off the internet that is the uh, tsunami inundation zone for Valparaiso. And we see that kind of the flood inundation zone is really marked out as a single area. But hopefully I've convinced you in this that that's not necessarily a realistic depiction of reality. And that we don't really know exactly what that zone is going to look like. It could be smaller, it could be larger in certain areas. It all depends on what could happen. And so we'll be able to redefine this in terms of risk and say, instead of just you're in or you're out, we can say this is a low risk zone, this is a high risk zone, this is a medium risk zone. And that's going to really give uh, community planners something that they can really get behind in terms of building infrastructure. Let's try and put our schools, let's try and put things that are important in places that are the lowest risk possible. And uh, it's going to be kind of an honest assessment of the actual risk of tsunamis in those zones. And uh, Mason wanted us to quickly talk about our future plans. I wanted to mention that I just graduated, so I'm trying to find a job very recently, so if anyone knows of any cool jobs doing coastal hazards, I would love to hear about it. And with that, go to questions. <laughs> I have one, one, real, one real quick question. On this map of El Paliso, would you mind pointing out where the settlement is? Yes, it's over kind of in this area over there. <laughs> So the low risk, right? Yes. <laughs> yeah, it looks really beautiful. Um, so do you work with like urban planners? Like is it is that kind of the ultimate trajectory that you're working with? So um, I would say this project, that that component is fairly um, fairly uncertain. We're hoping that that will come uh, to fruit, but we'll see. Um, but in the past, I definitely have done that to the point of um, like community meetings and trying to convince people to integrate climate change assessments into how they they build their communities. And do you find, or do you have any thoughts here on like receptivity towards that? Like, are people like kind of hungry for this info, or is it like, oh no, we're going to have to do a lot of changing and <laughs> working, <laughs> no one wants to do that? Uh, so I, I can't really say for here. Yeah. I can say from my previous experience, it's definitely like, you no know, people do not like to change, yeah. especially for a hazard that is, we don't like to think about 
hazards that are like vague and in the future. So it is a risk, but it's something that maybe we haven't seen firsthand not so much. Um, and people are, are less receptive to that. Um, yes. Um, oh. So me? Yeah, go So ahead. when it comes to like I guess doing the simulation, I was just wondering like where do you get this data? Like what kind of software do you use that to simulate them? Uh, for the tsunamis? Yeah. Uh, so the uh, Patricio at the university has kind of a dedicated cluster that he uses for specifically tsunami simulations. And there's, there's a variety of different kind of hydrodynamic software codes that you can use, depending on how, how accurate versus how long it takes. It's kind of a balance between which one you choose. Yes? Yeah, so <clears throat> I have seen the like wave sync lab at OSU because I got to spend the summer there. And so it was oh, really awesome. cool to like see that in action and they show, I wonder if you did it. Showed us like a bunch of stuff and like the little mini buildings and things going through and they're like, these are the people that could save themselves, but like it's not gonna work with cars and so we need great evacuation routes and so I feel like that is um, obviously like a, a social hang up or like social political like, if there's not the political will to even talk about it because people don't want to imagine the worst case scenario. Um, but anyway, in um, in Valdivia, like obviously the city's history and like collective memory is really tied to the 1960 earthquake since that's where it was and like thousands of people died and stuff. But um, I was wondering if you look at all about like, or if you look at stuff like um, coastal resiliency because of ecosystem type, because like Valdivia is, has a lot of wetlands or even you know, like land cover change with these events because like in Valdivia there were like a ton of hectares of native forest that just like sank after the tsunami, the tsunami and now they're like wetlands. So I guess is that, are you specifically looking at Valparaiso and that's what you're going to be doing the, um, the like probabilistic mapping for? Or are you going to do like a sort of selection of different coastal mm -hmm. types? Yeah. Uh, okay. I feel like there's a couple questions there. Yeah, so I'll try and <laughs> uh, So the kind of how much we're able to move about is going to depend on, on uh, how fast we're able to go, I guess. So we would love to do more uh, if we're able to kind of continue crunching this out super fast. It is a fairly limited amount of time, and then, right. so we'll see. Um, but it's definitely going to start kind of focused on Valparaiso. Um, and there's a ton of research in terms of uh, like ecosystem services in turn, and be able to help against tsunamis. Things like uh, building dunes or uh, kind of low wetlands are huge helps if you put your communities behind that. Uh, it's a whole, becomes a political problem very rapidly and that people want to live very close to the coast and, um, and don't really want to live behind something that you can't see the coast. Any questions? Cool. And the wave lab is awesome. <laughs> <laughs> Very cool. Okay, I'll keep lobbying you to put Valdivia at number two if you finish my face. <laughs> <laughs> yes. One more question. Yes. Oh, yeah. Oh, oh sorry, I thought oh. that you were asking a question. I have one. Yes, it was definitely. Uh, so I assume that this, uh, I don't know if I missed something during the presentation, but I assume that these maps are going to be reassessed as global warming keeps progressing, right? Yes, so that is something that we we could consider um that very rapidly our original plan was to uh we're not sure if we we're going to include climate change impacts to it right now in terms of that's a whole nother kind of ball of wax that we have to get into a whole other thing to consider sorry that was a phrase that doesn't maybe just it very well that's a oftentimes it's easier to just start without climate change involved and then add that in afterwards because that's uh, people sometimes react differently to thinking about sea level rise mm -hmm. that adds a lot of uncertainty to projections but that we could fairly easily incorporate that with this if that's what people want does that help yeah. <laughs> yes. great thank you again